Uh, Paul McKelly getting set to join us now. He heads PIMCO's short-term bond desk and leads the firm's cyclical economic forums and is a member of the investment committee. Kathleen Hayes joins us now with that exclusive interview. Kathleen? Thank you so much, Mark. And of course, uh, Paul McCulley is uh, notably saying in his recent uh, central bank focus, not only can the Fed uh, start hiking rates before it exits its credit easing, but by the way, don't look for any of that. So at least 2011. Uh, Paul joining us now from uh, the firm in Newport Beach, California. Paul, welcome. Oh, thank you. Good morning. Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's so fascinating as we get close to this meeting. Uh, a couple of traders already on Bloomberg Television earlier today uh, talking about how uh, they want to hear in the Fed's policy statement something about the exit strategy, which they hope the Fed has in place. But, and I think what, what, what's, I think, surprising to some people who don't really know how the Fed operates is you say because the Fed can pay interest on excess reserves, it can start raising rates whenever it feels like it, basically. Yes, I think it's something that's been missed in the marketplace. Is the Fed has a brand new tool. Historically, if you had this type of excess reserves in the banking system, which is over $800 billion, it would be technically impossible to hike the Fed funds rate off of zero because you've got uh, those reserves sloshing around in the banking system. But now they have a new tool, uh, which is paying interest on excess reserves, which should be the de facto floor uh, for the Fed funds rate. Uh, so uh, basically, while I was making uh, the case in that art in that article is that they don't have to sop up all of those excess reserves before they can start uh, a t tightening campaign. That said, I don't think they want to hike the Fed funds rate for any very extended period of time. So uh, I wasn't forecasting nearby hikes at all in the Fed funds rate, but simply pointing out they have the technical ability to do that without soaking up uh, all of that excess liquidity. Okay, and we want to, I want to get specifically to your forecast uh, because if your forecast is wrong, then the Fed may have to go to this this kind of step a lot sooner than you're looking for and maybe some other people. Because it, you, you quote in this article uh, what Ben Bernanke, the Fed chairman, actually pointed out in a speech recently, which I think is very instructive, that the Fed's quantitative easing is a credit easing, whereas the Bank of Japan's was more focused on excess reserves. And that this is really a key difference as we try to understand how the Fed's going to operate. Absolutely. The Bank of Japan was targeting excess reserves as if they had intrinsic importance to the system at large, where for the Fed, excess reserves are a consequence of what they're doing on the asset side of their balance sheet. Some of the programs on the asset side will naturally uh, decline over time as the financial system heals, and we're always seeing that with the CPFF. Uh, however, they're buying longer-dated securities, notably MBS, which won't necessarily mature before uh, they uh, reach the point where they'll need to tighten. Uh, so in that instance, the tool of paying interest on excess reserves will be a very viable tool. Well, Paul, as you know, many people who are concerned about a surge in inflation are just worried that no matter what you say and no matter about paying interest on excess reserves, the Fed's just not going to be able to move quickly enough. That this is, you know, over a $2 trillion balance sheet now, and, and that's why we're going to build up some inflation pressures. Well, I think the monetarists are coming back out of the woodwork as if uh, the monetary base per se had a direct connection to uh, inflation. It doesn't. Uh, I look at inflation as a product of the amount of slack that you have in the economy. Uh, it's certainly hard to argue the case that we're going to have an overheated economy anytime soon from a starting point north of nine, perhaps up to 10 uh, for the unemployment rate. So uh, I see the excess reserves, but they don't bother me from a monetarist perspective. I just have to confess I'm a old-fashioned Keynesian who believes that inflation is predominantly a function of the degree of slack in the economy, particularly on a cyclical basis. So, uh, you know, do you, I want to I be a, a little bit tough here, not really, because never, never tough enough on you guys, our, our viewers tell us, but, you know, if you look back to the Fed's big, long string of rate increases, you know, which, which took us, what, up to five and a quarter, uh, someone sent me, well, here's what McCauley said, you, you, were, you didn't see the rate increases as, as high as they got, you saw the Fed stopping sooner. Is there a chance this time, Paul, that similarly when you say no rate increases until 2011, don't worry about inflation, that maybe you're underestimating the economy here again, underestimating or overestimating the Federal Reserve's ability to keep inflation at bay? 
Well, that's certainly uh, a possibility. I don't claim to uh, be 100% prescient. Uh, I happen to be a bowler, but I don't roll 300 every time. In fact, I'm lucky when I'm over 200. Uh, so certainly I can be wrong, but uh, I like to have the critics explain to me how I'm going to be wrong. Uh, given this degree of slack uh, in the economy, it's very difficult for me to see an incipient inflationary problem. To be sure, you can get rising commodity prices, but actually that weakens the economy because we're a net importer of commodities in the United States. So uh, if you look at inflation on an enduring basis as a function of slack, I have difficulty getting there, but I certainly concede that uh, I have been wrong, and I'm certainly sure that I'll be wrong again on something uh, in the future, probably not too distant future. Forecasting is not an easy game. It sure isn't. And, and Paul, you, you're the one who, who has to sit there and make these forecasts, but how do you then respond to the bond market? We've seen this huge turnaround in rates, and to a certain extent, we can say, well, it's just adjusting to the fact, as you told me last Last time we talked that there, there isn't going to be financial Armageddon. The markets had to adjust. But the bond market's stance right now, its concern does seem to be more on the possibility of inflation. Are they going to, are they going to do the job for the Fed and in the long run make your forecast correct? They tighten up on rates. Fed doesn't have to do anything. There's a bit of self-regulation in the marketplace. If the long lean gets wrapped around the axle about inflation, whether you can get it or not, if they, for, for a period of time, are romancing that and back up long-term interest rates excessively, it will weaken the economy and make their forecast of higher inflation uh, truncated. So, yeah, there is a self-regulating uh, part of the overall process. I actually think there are three things involved in the backup. Number one is simply cutting off the fat tail of financial Armageddon. That's been cut off. And I think the Fed can look around with smiles of approval that they achieve that. Uh, so you, you get reverse flight to quality. Uh, that's part of the reason. I think the incredible supply, particularly of long-dated treasuries, is part of the reason. Mm -hmm. And with respect to inflation, when I look at the break-evens and tips, it's right around 2%, which is where the Fed is okay. targeting it longer term. So I don't see a big negative message there. All right. Well, uh, more with PIMCO Managing Director Paul McCauley on what he expects the Fed's to write in its policy. Policy statement on Wednesday. That's coming up when Bloomberg News returns. We're back with Paul McCulley. He's managing director at PIMCO, and he, among many other things, heads PIMCO's short-term bond desk. And Paul, you just gave me three reasons why. Uh, the, for the backup in rates, and of course, one of them was uh, Treasury supply. Uh, but what about the backup in mortgage rates? How are you? How concerned are you about that? Another thing that, quite apart from the backup in the ten-year note, having a direct impact, it seems, on mortgage applications, just at a time when people are seeing some bottoming in the housing market. Uh, the mortgages have backed up precisely because the treasuries have backed up. Mortgages trade at a spread to treasuries. In fact, mortgages have actually richened uh, to treasury during this backup, so therefore they haven't backed up as much. But they certainly have backed up uh, and are going to have a negative effect on uh, the bottoming process and the recovery in the housing market, which is another one of those self-regulating sort of forces we were talking about. To the extent that the backup weakens prospects for the housing sector, it means that the Fed is on hold for longer. What does it mean for uh, PIMCO's portfolio broadly, even in you know, the total return fund, wherever you guys are? Because one of the things you're holding a lot of right now is mortgage-backed securities. Yes, we are. And remember, uh, our benchmark has a duration, and we can get our duration in a number of uh, sectors. And to the extent that we've been getting our duration up to index through the mortgage sector, that's been a winning trade. We've been overweight mortgages versus treasuries versus the index, uh, and mortgages have outperformed. So it's been okay for us. Okay. Um, what, about, uh, what about your position in treasuries? And Again, if the Fed loses the credibility fight to any extent, what does that mean for PIMCO? We're dramatically underweight treasuries, uh, so therefore, per se, that would not hurt us. But I think it's hugely important for the outlook itself uh, if the Fed were to, quote-unquote, lose control of the longer end of the curve. And I think there's a limit to that. And one of the big limits is if it looked like uh, that rates were going up, notwithstanding the fact that the Fed is committed to holding short rates down for irrational fears about of inflation, uh, then I think it would have a negative effect on risk appetite, a negative effect on the stock market, and would be self-correcting. 
You know, uh, I want to, we're, we're showing the inflation rate. I also want to bring up the, the peak in jobless claims, Paul, because there does seem to have been a peak. And, you know, many economists, many Wall Street economists say this is a sign of a recession bottoming, and it's been a very powerful sign. Uh, do you see that as well? Are we starting to turn this recession boat towards recovery? I think I generally buy the proposition that a stabilization in initial unemployment claims uh, is an important signal that you're bottoming. I would stress that the level of initial unemployment claims is still consistent with negative job creation okay. just at a slower pace than we had earlier this year. So I think we're all living in a second derivative world in the financial markets, but Main Street is not just about the second derivative, it's the first derivative in, in that it's not just enough that somebody doesn't lose his job. The guy who lost his okay. job needs to be able to find another one. Two more questions, Paul. One, what do you expect sure. to see in that policy statement? Are we getting are we getting overly expectant of what the Fed can deliver on Wednesday? We probably are. If anything, what I'm expecting is for the Fed to put a modifier in on uh, the proposition that it's going to hold uh, the Fed funds rate at an exceedingly low level for, quote, an extended period, by, and modifying that to say, given uh, that the outlook for it, core inflation uh, is that it could be uncomfortably low or something to that nature. So I think they'll tie their pre-commitment uh, to uh, having a low Fed funds rate uh, to their outlook uh, for or continued disinflation at the core level. I think that would be a good addition to reinforce that it's not an arbitrary time frame. It's conditional upon uh, a particular uh, economic forecast. Paul, before I let you go, I have to ask you about the big article in the New York Times about PIMCO and whether or not it's going to be a, a money manager in the PPIP program. Uh, a lot of issues raised about conflict of interest and, and special influence. Uh, do you guys at PIMCO feel any of this is valid or do you feel you're being picked on? <clears throat> First thing let me say is that uh, the reporting or the research for that article was done uh, in early April, so there's been a lot that's happened uh, since early April. That's just a factual matter. From the standpoint of PPIP itself, you and I have talked about this in that I'm not directly part of the negotiations uh, on PPIP for PIMCO, and if I were, I couldn't talk to you about it. Uh, so therefore, uh, I simply don't have anything to say there because I'm not involved, okay. and if I were, I couldn't talk to you. Oh, we would all, we wouldn't want you to stop talking to us. So I guess I'm glad you're not involved. Well, about Paul. that issue, Kathleen. Okay. I'll talk to you about anything else. You know that. All right, Paul McCauley, Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for joining well, thank us today. Thank you, Kathleen. For now, I'm sending it back on over to Mark Crumpton. Kathleen, thanks.